Hello, and welcome to my complete guide to Solak for Beginners. The objective of this guide is to take someone who either isn't familiar at all with Solak or maybe has tried it before in the past and had a bad time and break down every single mechanic and every single attack to allow someone who is completely new to the boss to start successfully getting kills. In this video, we're gonna look at gear setups, we're gonna talk strategy, and then we're gonna go through every single mechanic this boss fight has phase by phase until we've covered everything. After that, we'll take a look at some complete kills start to finish, and I'll give you guys some other overall pointers or things to look out for. This is a very long guide, so let's not waste any time and get right into it. The last thing I'm gonna say before we start is that practice makes perfect. You could watch this video a hundred times, and even at that point, you likely would not get a kill on your very first attempt. That being said, this video should prepare you for everything this boss can throw at you. Let's get right into it. To start things off, who is Solak? Solak is an endgame boss with complex mechanics and valuable rewards. Solak can be taken on by teams of 2 to 7 players. Solak has between 3 and 8 million life points and drops both the Blightbound crossbows as well as Aerithor's Grimoire. But if you clicked on this video, you probably already have an idea who Solak is. You want to know how to take him down. The requirements for this guide are tier 90 plus weapons of any style, tier 80 plus armor of the same style that you have the weapons in, as well as level 95 plus prayer for at least the turmoil level curses. You're also going to want 89 plus herblore for the base overloads, although you want to use the best overloads you can. I see a lot of people using standard or holy overloads when they've got the level for supreme overloads or elder overloads, and this is not a boss you're going to want to do that. Use the overloads that give you the best stats. Here are some recommended things that are not necessarily required, but will be used in this guide. We're going to be using Dominion Mines, a Planted Feet perk switch, a Ring of Vigor switch, as well as the Enhanced Excalibur. We will also be using a Steel Titan, which requires level 99 summoning. If you don't have all these things, that's probably fine and you'll get by, but if you're planning on doing this boss for an extended period of time, these are all things that are worth getting. Now we're going to talk a little bit about familiars. I see a lot of learners taking pack mammoths and they end up failing DPS checks because they don't have a titan helping them out. The two points where you're most likely to fail a kill when learning the boss are both DPS related. So a steel titan is going to be significantly more useful than a pack mammoth even on a complete learner team. A steel titan will also promote better learning and dealing with the mechanics properly. When done correctly, you will use next to no food. And even in our sample kills for this guide with sample gear, almost all of our food was untouched because we did the mechanics correctly. Even if you're basing, you should not need a pack mammoth, and I would strongly recommend learning on a titan. Now, although we talked about some of the switches and items that are good to have that we will be using, here are some things that were not used in the sample kills and the research for this guide. We will not be Fortic auto attacking, we will not be using flanking or lunging switches, and we will also not be using Aerithor's Grimoire. Aerithor's Grimoire is best in slot at Solak, and it doesn't even use charges at that boss, so it's free to use once you've purchased it. Unfortunately, the upfront cost of it is so high that it's actually two to three times more expensive than the entire rest of our gear setups combined. Because of this, we will not be using it. Speaking of things we will not be doing in this guide, hybriding. Hybriding takes advantage of Berserk and Sunshine or Death Swiftness not sharing a cooldown. It is used in most high-end Solak teams as once mastered, this boss requires next to no food. We will not be hybriding in this guide as it is not necessary to properly learn the boss. I found in my research that most players actually deal more damage style camping versus hybriding until they've got a lot of experience both with hybriding and with the boss. This also greatly reduces the number of switches and the number of inputs, which means more food, more mistakes can be made, and you're a lot more likely to get the kills. Once you've mastered the boss though, hybriding is a ton of fun, and it is how I personally kill the boss now. Now, before you go to Solak, you've got to pick a combat style. Teams normally have at least one mage or range user. This person would be the base. Combat style doesn't really matter outside of that, and you can learn the boss with any style you want. In this video, I'll be showing the base perspective as a mage, and the DPS perspective as a melee. Before you go to Solak, you will also want to pick a team size. Solak can be killed in teams of 2 to 7 players. All mechanics scale linearly to team size. In my experience, teams of 3, 4, and 5 are ideal for learning. In my opinion, Duo is the most difficult team size when learning. Duo was used to record the majority of backing footage in this guide for that reason, but if you do want to learn in a Duo and it doesn't go well or you miss by just a few thousand life points at the end, consider bringing a third person or a fourth person, as you should find especially the final phase will go a lot more smoothly. But more on that later. Once you've got an idea what your team size is going to look like, it's time to get geared. Here's an example of the gear and invent setup for a DPSer at Solak. 
I'm wearing full custom fit trim masterwork, although anything tier 90 or tier 80 will suffice. I'm also using Cinderbane gloves as they're very good at Solak. In my pocket slot, I'm camping a scrimshot of vampirism, and because of this, I should use next to no food this entire kill. That being said, if you're lacking in damage output, something like a godbook would be a better option. The grimoire is best in slot, but because of its price, it will not be included. Next up, I've got a set of Drygores as well as some alloy armor spikes. These give you a tiny bit of extra damage every time you're hit. It's not much, but it's better than nothing, which is the alternative. I'm using a Ring of Death, and this will be your best friend when learning this boss. After that, I've got an Amulet of Souls as well as a Kiln Cape. For the invent, you're going to want the best overload and then the best adrenaline potion you can get your hands on. After that, I've got a two-dose weapon poison as well as four spiritual prayer potions. Not only will these be giving me prayer points, but they'll also be renewing my familiar's special attack bar, so my titan will spec more often. I've got exactly four dominion mines, a malevolent kite shield, and a noxious scythe. You could easily do this with a scythe or dragor as you don't really need both, but two of the strongest melee abilities are cleave and decimate and they don't share a cooldown. If you're willing to swap to a scythe every fourth ability, you will greatly increase your damage output, which is probably not a bad thing to learn. After that, I've got a Ring of Vigor as well as an Enhanced Excalibur. At the bottom of my invent, I've got two rune pouches, one for Vengeance and one for Disruption Shield. Vengeance isn't absolutely necessary, but Disruption Shield is nice to bring. If you have it unlocked, it will help and you'll be able to use it quite frequently during the kill. Next up, I've got food. I'm taking six Sour Omen Brews as well as eight Blue Blubber Jellyfish. Depending on how much food you're going through, you can tweak this ratio and bring more brews and fewer blubbers, but this seemed to work out pretty well for me. If you're wondering what perks I have on my melee gear, they're all on screen. Here's an example of a mage base gear and invent setup. I'm not going to touch on anything that's exactly the same as the DPS perspective, but I'm wearing full tectonic, I've got a scrimshaw of the elements in my pocket slot, I've got a noxious staff, and I've got a rune pouch that has runes for both vulnerability as well as air spells. If you wanted to, you could also take blood spells, and that's not a terrible idea, but you'd either need spellbook swap or vulnerability bombs to keep the boss debuffed at all times. In my invent, it's pretty much the exact same, minus two changes. Because I'm using magic, I've got a wand of the elders that has planted feet on it, and I've also got myself a Virtus wand. The Virtus Wand has a perk called Karoming 3 on it. It's a very niche perk that isn't good in too many instances, but it can make Phase 4 of Solak ever so slightly easier. This is not a perk that I would get before going to Solak for the first time, but if you do go and you start to struggle with the final phase, it can make a pretty significant difference. Outside of that, the main hand Dragor is just for the bladed dive ability. I put on the Dragor with my Excalibur, and that allows me to get around a little quicker. You're also going to notice I've got more Sardon Wind Brews in my base preset, and instead of Blubber Jellyfish, I've actually got Sailfish. This is done in case I make a mistake or I need to combo eat. You're welcome to tweak the brew to food ratio as much as you would like, or even bring some blubbers as well, but this should be more than enough food. These are all the perks on my magic gear. The last thing we have to do before we're ready to take on Solak is find your extra action button. You can do this by pressing escape and then going into edit mode and then advanced options. And there, you're going to scroll down until you find the extra action button. Toggle it on and off a couple times and make sure you know where it is. You're going to want to move it somewhere that's going to be easy to click. You won't need the special action button until later on in the boss fight, but have an idea where it is. It'll be important later on. Okay. I think we're finally ready to start the fight. The first couple mechanics are a little more complicated, but you'll find as the fight and the video goes on, they get a little more streamlined as there are a lot of similarities between mechanics. Don't be discouraged if it starts off a little confusing, it'll make more and more sense as the fight goes on. This is a list of all of the phase 1 mechanics in the order they appear. We're going to go through them one at a time and break down exactly what to do for each of them. I've also included the life point thresholds depending on your team size. The very first mechanic we're going to look at is pads. Solak will raise his arms in the air, and one green pad will appear on the floor for each member of the team. This means in duo mode, there will be two pads. If you're going in a five-man, there will be five. You need to look for a vacant pad and move towards it. Every missed pad will hit the entire team for roughly 5,000 damage. After the pads disappear, your bladed dive and surge cooldowns will be reset, so you can then bladed dive or surge back to your original position. After the pads disappear, you'll see a bar above your head fill up. Once full, you'll be hit for between 2,500 and 7,000 damage. You'd want a Resonance or Disruption Shield once the bar fills up to avoid all damage. Timing this Resonance or Disruption Shield can take some practice, and it's something that's worth learning early on as you can use a well-timed Resonance or Disruption Shield many times throughout the Solak fight. What you're going to do is, when the bar is about to fill up and you're about to be hit, you're going to wait for either a ranged or a melee attack to hit you. As soon as it does, you're immediately going to use either Resonance or Disruption Shield, and it will block that attack. If you Resonance or Disruption Shield too early, the auto attack will break it and you'll still take full damage. If you have trouble getting this timing down, the easier way to do it that doesn't require timing anything is to use Devotion just after the pads. If you do this and have protection prayers on, you can resonance anytime and you'll block the hit. 
The pads require a ton of coordination, especially in a larger team. In a duo, it's pretty easy to say the base takes the closest one, the DPSer takes the further one. But in teams of three, four, five, six, and seven players, you're gonna get a bunch of pads spawning all over the map, and you need to very quickly figure out who's going where. It's really important to communicate with your teammates here, and voice communications can make a very big difference, especially for this part of the boss fight. The next mechanic are the ground roots. Solak will spawn eight roots around the edges of the arena. These green circles represent where the roots will spawn. If you have Dominion Mines, you can place them on the two southern roots before the fight starts. In a duo, the base would go to the southeast and the DPSer would go to the southwest or vice versa. In a larger team, just split the team size in two and make sure half the mines are on each side. Once the roots actually spawn, your mines will automatically go off and clear those southern roots. From that point, you're going to start on either the northeast or the northwestern side and then work your way down. By the time you've cleared the four northernmost roots, your Dominion Mines will be off cooldown and you'll be able to place them again on the southernmost roots that are still alive. In doing this, you only actually have to deal damage to four of the eight roots. If any of the roots have a couple life points left at the end, just finish them off and then get back on Solak. While I clear my roots in the background, I'm going to talk about what happens if you do not kill the roots. If you leave the roots alive for too long, they will turn into Blightbound Lashers. The Blightbound Lashers will have the same amount of life points as the original root did, but they can also heal the roots near them all the way up to full life points. They have an incredibly long attack range and should be able to hit most people on the team with ranged attacks that can hit up to 3500 damage. If you do end up with Lashers, the best way to kill them is with stuns, as that will stop them from attacking anybody on the team. That being said, as long as you notice when the roots spawn and you go around and kill them, you should not get Lashers ever. Now that I've killed the two northwestern roots, I'm going to go over to the third root, and instead of attacking it, I'm going to drop both my Dominion Mines at the same time right next to it. In doing so, they're both going to go off, one-shot the root, and I'm able to get back on Solak. The next mechanic is pretty straightforward. It's the personal roots. Two members of the team will get a timer on screen and a flashing arrow on their minimap. When the timer reaches zero, three roots will shoot out from the location of the arrow to the location of the player. Anyone on the team that's hit by the roots will be stunned and take mass damage every tick. If you get a personal root, you're going to move towards the arrow as quickly as possible with surge and or bladed dive. You're going to communicate the location of your root to your teammates and you're going to move away from the arrow as soon as the timer is right around one second. If you don't completely trust your timing, you can also use Anticipation or Freedom here, so that if you do get hit by your root or anybody else's, you will not be stunned in place. If you get it down completely, you actually don't need to Anticipate or Freedom, as if you run away correctly, the roots will hit where you were standing and will not actually come in contact with you. There's a chance that when the personal roots come out, you'll still be dealing with the ground roots, which is the mechanic we talked about just before. If this is the case, prioritize dealing with your personal root and then go back and finish off the root on the ground. For what it's worth, this is what happens when you do the roots incorrectly and you do not tell your teammate that you've got a root going across the entire room that's going to hit you in the face. Oh god! Shaq! Oh my god, here we go. You will notice, even though I take an absolute ton of damage, I still manage to clear my root and I don't die either. I survived because I used freedom the second I got stunned and then I ate a couple of food. Mechanic 4 is also a super easy one. It's the Blight Bomb. 1-3 to three DPS rolls will get a bar above their head. When it completely fills up, they'll be hit by a 3x3 three three AoE attack that will deal 4000 plus damage to all nearby players. All you gotta do is take a few steps away from the nearby players and use either Resonance or Disruption Shield to avoid all damage. After the first Blight Bomb, Solak will begin to attack a little bit faster. You don't really need to do anything here, but you could use Devotion if you wanted to. There are going to be a total of two Blight Bombs, and as soon as the second bomb explodes, the following mechanic will begin. The next mechanic will allow you to soul split back all of your life points, so there's no need to block this attack unless you think it's going to take your life points all the way to zero. After the Blight Bomb, Solak will go right into arms and legs. Solak will move to the center of the arena and stop attacking the player. His arms will become attackable. They must be killed before the yellow bar fills up completely. After the arms, Solak's legs will become attackable. You're going to want to attack the arms with basic and threshold abilities. Remember to use vulnerability and turn your overhead prayers to soul split. It's also not a bad idea to call your Steel Titan in the familiar interface, as sometimes on phase 1, your Titan will get stuck and forget how to attack. Once the arms go down, attack the legs. If you're meleeing, you want to use thresholds and basic abilities, and if you're ranging or maging, you want to use your damage boosting ultimate. Certain area of effect abilities will hit both legs. These include a fully charged detonate, as well as hurricane and dragon breath if you're positioned correctly. If you cannot kill the arms and legs in time, you're going to take a bunch of damage and two blightbound lashers will also spawn. If this happens, there's a very high chance of death, and you're 
you're very likely to have to restart the kill. Especially for the base, unless you're very quick and good with your defensive abilities, it's not a bad idea to simply restart and take another crack at it. If you absolutely had to, you could use your damage boosting ultimates for the arms and the legs, so basically use them right away, but this is not advised. You shouldn't need to do this with a proper rotation, and it's going to greatly slow down your kill. The final mechanic in phase 1 is the Blight Core. As soon as you finish the legs, a blue core will spawn just south of Solak. The core will last up for 18 seconds, and that's your window to deal as much damage to it as you possibly can. If you're using melee, this is where you're going to use Berserk. If you're using magic or ranged, you intentionally used your damage boosting ultimate on the legs so that when the core spawns, you still have over 18 seconds of it left. After 18 seconds, the core will despawn. The goal is to get the core below half life points on the first cycle. Some teams will do the core in a single cycle, but that's more of an advanced strategy. As soon as the core despawns, resume dealing damage to Solak. If you can get him to the HP cap, which is 2.25 million life points in duo, but I've put all the other ones on screen as well, Solak will instantly go back to arms life legs and then repeat the arms legs and the blight core until you finish off the core. As soon as the core goes down, phase 2 begins. Until you get select to the phase 1 HP cap, he's going to continue to go through the same set of mechanics that we just learned in the exact same order. If you get Solak to the HP cap that's listed on screen at any point, the very next mechanic going down the list will automatically be arms and then legs and then the blight core. Some of you may be wondering why you don't Onslaught the Blight Core. In terms of overall damage output, Onslaught may be more damage for the mage or range user. Here's the problem. Not only do you get less damage output on the legs if you're just using thresholds and building up to Onslaught, but you also get less damage on Solak after the core ends, which makes it less likely that you're going to skip the second set of ground roots. Although you could use Onslaught purely for adrenaline reasons, I would strongly not recommend it. Once the Blight Core HP reaches zero, congratulations, you finished the first phase of Solak. It's time to get into P2. Phase 2 introduces Blight Stacks. For each Blight Stack you have, you'll take 1% increased damage. A number of the mechanics throughout the remainder of the boss fight will increase your number of Blight Stacks. You can clear your stacks by clicking Cleanse on Marathel, who is stood at the south side of the arena, and then standing in the green circle that appears just north of her. There's a short cooldown on this, but you can clear your Blight Stacks as many times as you would like throughout the remainder of the fight. Phase 2 features 6 separate mechanics, although some of them happen multiple times, and some of them you aren't likely to see at all. Phase 2 will end when the HP bar under Solax reaches 0%. This is lowered both by dealing damage to Solak and progressing through the phase. In Phase 2, you're going to start with an Anima Storm, and then go into Bombs, a first Anima Rain, an Arm Climb, a second Anima Rain, and then you've got the Tornado. You're very likely to finish the phase before the following 4 mechanics. We'll still go over how to do them, but you're very unlikely to see them. The first mechanic of Phase 2 is the Anima Storm. The Anima Storm will deal periodic damage to all players. Each hit taken from the storm will increase your Blight stacks by 1. You want to avoid standing in the purple cloud in the middle of the room as it will deal rapid damage and increase your Blight stacks even faster. 4 Anima Eruptions will spawn in the 4 corners of the arena. Once killed, they will become a one-time portal that will transport you above the ground and allow you to destroy the storm. Here's how to deal with the special. Computer! Enhance. The storm takes damage based off the amount of blight stacks you have. At 0 stacks, you will deal 10,000 damage per click, and at 10 stacks, you'll deal no damage. Before killing the first anima eruption, use Cleanse on Marathel and stand in the green circle north of her to remove all of your blight stacks. As soon as you've been cleansed, kill the eruption and either surge or bladed dive to the blue ring where the eruption used to be. Once you do this, you'll be transported into the sky. Once you're above, spam click on the storm circle in the center of the room to deal damage to it. Be extremely careful when you drop back down as Solar Black loves to switch who his primary target is and melee the person who's praying ranged or range the person who's praying melee. You may want to eat up here and this would also be a good time to use resonance. You want to repeat this with the other eruptions until the storm completely dissipates. It should take two climbs and can be done in either one or two cleanses depending on how quickly you clear each eruption. As soon as the storm clears, finish off any remaining eruptions and then run all the way north before using a DPS boosting ultimate. If you get the storm to low HP but don't completely kill it, it shouldn't be the end of the world. You'll take a bit of extra damage but it will die to poison. If you completely ignore the storm, you're going to take damage from it for the remainder of phase 2. I'll also note that in larger team sizes, the base will generally not climb. The base will stay north and DPS the two eruptions that will likely not be needed, while the DPSers will go up on the two southern eruptions and clear the storm there. The second mechanic of phase 2 is a super fun one. It's the bombs. Solak will yell, rip the earth open, spill the blood of life, and bombs will spawn and detonate 
all around the room in a 3 by 3 range. Standing in the cubby at the north of the room should stop most bombs from hitting you. The first bombs will only deal 1 to 2,000 damage, but the later ones can hit up to 8,000. If a bomb is going to hit you, it is worth moving out of the way to avoid it, even if that means running out of your damage boosting ultimate ability. Alternatively, you could also use Debilitate or Reflect to reduce the damage taken, although running around is generally a better approach. Continue to dodge the bombs until they stop spawning. In research, we saw a lot of teams like to barricade at this point, and it's just not worth it. If you're moving around correctly, there should not be a high chance of death, especially if you're keeping your HP relatively high. This is a point where you're going to want to deal damage to the boss. I will also mention that in some larger teams, the base will stand in the cubby to the north, and all of the DPSers will fan out behind a Solak. This is to take advantage of the flanking perk, and it works exactly the same way. Try not to get hit by any bombs, and if any bombs do hit you, try and have enough life points that they won't one-shot you. Shortly after the bombs stop spawning, a golden dome will appear next to you. Clicking on it will grant you one use of nature's blessing. This is a 5x5 shield that is placed on the ground and will protect you and your team from the anima rain. The golden dome will grant you a total of three shields. You want to coordinate who's going to be taking the shields and make sure you're standing close to whoever is placing the first one. Some teams will use two shields on the very first rain for convenience, but this is done only if you know you're not going to need the third shield. When you're learning, I would advise all bunching up and only using one shield per anima rain. This way, if you've got a longer phase, you don't need to worry about it and you'll have enough shields to make it to the end. Solak will say let it rain down upon you. The shield dropper should wait one to two abilities and then press the extra action button to deploy the shield. It's the button we positioned before going through the phase one mechanics, so you should know where yours is. The rain will hit you five times, each time dealing 2,000 damage inside of the shield and close to 10,000 if you're standing outside of it. Although you can use defensives like Debilitate and Devotion, you could also run outside of the shield and use Resonance to get to full HP after the first few hits to deal with this mechanic without using any food or defensive thresholds. If you really don't trust your timing and you're worried that one of Solak's auto attacks is going to snipe your Resonance and you're going to get one shot by the Anima Rain, it's not a bad idea, especially as you're getting more familiar with this boss, to use Devotion before you run out. That way your Resonance doesn't need to be perfectly timed and you're guaranteed to get all the way up to full HP. One note I will add only for the base is that they should not resonance the fifth rain hit as you're going to need it shortly after. Where might the base be needing resonance? Well, it's for the arm climb. As soon as the first rain ends, Solak will state, I'll crush you like the bug you are, and pick one member of the team to drag into melee distance and stun. If you get grabbed, use freedom and then move away from where you were pulled. At this point, every DPSer should ultimate and hit the boss as hard as they can. The DPS will not take any damage for the rest of this mechanic, so you can put on Soul Split as well. Solak will collapse, and you'll be given the chance to climb on top of him and strike him with a deadly blow. The base should click on Solak's arm to climb, and then ultimate as soon as the climb animation begins. If you're using melee, you will not be able to attack Solak here, which is why it's suggested that the base use either mage or ranged. After the climb ends, Solak will attack the player who climbed with a crushing blow that deals 9,000 plus melee damage. The base should either rezo, devotion, or disruption shield to negate the attack. After the arm climb, you're going to get a second anima rain. It's exactly the same as the first and can be dealt with identically. After the second anima rain, you have the tornado. The tornado is likely to be the final mechanic you see on phase two, but I will be covering the other ones as well, just in case. Solak will yell and do his best Beyblade impression. He'll start spinning around and you'll see a purple vortex on your screen. He will hit all players for 9,000 plus damage five times. Unlike for the Anima Rain, Nature's Blessing will not reduce this attack. One member of the team should barricade and intercept the other members, or all members should use barricade. After the tornado, all players will have 50 plus blight stacks, so you may want to consider going to Marathel and cleansing to remove your stacks. Especially if you're a competent DPSer, you're likely going to be in phase 3 at this point. That being said, I'm going to go through the following two mechanics that we haven't talked about yet that will occur in phase 2 if you do not complete it by this point. The first of the two is the root arrow, and it's incredibly easy. Solak is going to state it's time to die and will stop moving. He will then launch three roots directly in front of him that deal mass damage. Simply surge or run behind him and resume attacking. That's literally it. The DPS bomb is a mechanic you're unlikely to see on phase 2, but you will be guaranteed to see it on phase Three. I'm going to pull a clip from phase 3 to explain how it works, as you're a lot more likely to see it there. A maximum of 3 DPSers on the team will get a bar above their head. Once full, it will hit an AoE 3x3, 3000 to 4000 damage. If you get a bar above your head, you want to move away from the rest of the team and use resonance for a free heal when the bar fills up. If the DPS bomb is on more than one person, when it explodes it will connect the involved players with a root. This root will deal damage to anyone caught in it, but will not damage those who had the DPS bomb. If you draw a line connecting all the players with a bar above their head to make a triangle, so long as no other players on the team are caught in that triangle, you should be good to go. 
This is pretty much a perfect example of how to do this mechanic. If you're any further out, you could start hitting other people on the team, and if you're any closer together, you're gonna start being hit by each other's blight bombs, which is not recommended unless you're trying to die. On phase three, you will want to use anticipate before you use resonance, but more on that later. Phase 3 features only three separate mechanics, but unlike the first two phases that play in a linear fashion, the pace of Phase 3 is completely controlled by the base. The mechanics are the charge pads, the DPS bomb which we've already talked about, and the team stun. Phase 3 will end and Phase 4 will begin as soon as either all green pads are charged up by the base or Aerithor is killed in the Mind Realm. Killing Aerithor is strongly recommended, as not only will it be faster, but it will also make your Phase 4 easier. The next mechanic we're going to talk about is the team stun. Solak will state, give me the life you so tightly cling to and stun all players for two seconds. All players will be hit with blight damage that will increase constantly until enough players have stunned Solak. As soon as Solak stuns you, you're going to want to use freedom so you can resume attacking. Follow that up by using any of your stunning abilities. The number of stuns required is your team size minus two, but with a minimum of one. Stuns with the flanking perk will also still work. To summarize, if Solak stuns you, stun him back. If you do this, you should not take any extra damage. In case the formula didn't make sense, I've displayed the number of players who are required to stun based on your team size. As a general rule, you won't assign specific players to be stunners, and everyone on the team should try and use a stun. The next mechanic of Phase 3 is the DPS Bomb. It's the same as in Phase 2, but with one slight difference. It will happen as often as every 30 seconds throughout the entire phase, and the team stun mechanic can happen at the same time. Because of this, if you get a bar above your head, you want to use Anticipate to prevent Solak from stunning you, and then use Resonance for your heal. Outside of using Anticipate first, it's exactly identical to the mechanic we covered in Phase 2. Now let's talk about the Charge Pads. These are the fundamental mechanic of Phase 3. As soon as the phase starts, 8 green pads will form a circle around the Solak room. Although the base controls the pads and the pace of the pads, the DPSers should have an understanding of what they are and how they work. All 8 pads can be charged up by bringing Solak to them. If a pad is charging, it will look like this, with a blue dotted line going around the pad. Once charged, the pad will turn purple and Solak will stop attacking the players. Up to 2 players will be granted entry into the Mind Realm and can enter by pressing the extra action button that will permanently be on screen for the remainder of the boss fight. We're going to talk about how you might approach the Mind Realm on Phase 3 in just a moment, but for the majority of green pads, once they're charged up, you're going to throw on Soul Split and deal damage to Solak. What is the Mind Realm? When the first or second pad is charged, members of the team should use the extra action button to enter the Mind Realm. Regardless of team size, only two players can enter the Mind at a time. In a duo, only the DPSer needs to enter. Be very careful in the Mind Realm as food will not heal you, although Soul Split will. Once inside, you should attack Aerothor to lower his life points to under 60,000. He attacks with ranged and only hits one player. He doesn't hit that hard, so you should not need any defensive abilities so long as you've entered the Mind Realm with over half your life points, and you should be able to focus on dealing as much damage as you can. You'll want to use Berserk or Metamorphosis as soon as you enter. After 18 seconds, you'll be transported out of the Mind Realm and will reappear in the center of the Solak Room. The goal is to lower Aerithor's HP so that he can be easily finished off once you're ready to move on to Phase 4. This can take multiple entries depending on the team size and DPS. Let's take a look at that right now. On screen, I've listed both Aerithor's HPs as well as the Phase 3 endpoint, depending on your team size. Once Solak gets to the HP cap of Phase 3, the base will charge a pad, allowing one or two players to enter the mind and finish Aerithor off. As soon as it goes down, Phase 4 will begin immediately. Phase 4 is where things get interesting. For the DPSers, it's very simple. You will have a limited time to deal as much damage as you can to Solak and finish off the kill. The HP bar under Solak's is the Mind HP, and if it reaches zero before Solak's HP does, the entire team will be insta-killed. The base will enter the Mind Realm and try and buy the DPS as much time as they can. In general, the DPSers should have between 30 and 50 seconds to kill the boss before the base will be overwhelmed in the mind. If you're in a duo and you fail any of these phase 4 steps, don't be disheartened. It's significantly more difficult to do this in a duo than any other team size. If you miss it by just a little bit, consider bringing a third or a fourth person as it will make it significantly easier. In a duo, you have 300,000 damage to deal between two people, and one of those two people is going to spend a majority of their time in the realm. In a trio, all of a sudden, you have 400,000 damage to deal, so 100,000 more, but instead of only having one DPSer out, you have two. Let's start off by looking at what the DPSers should do. Solak will not move or auto-attack during this phase. The phase will start with a red message on screen. After this message disappears, Solak will be attackable but not damageable for 12 seconds. You should take this time to use the natural instinct ability and then build back up to 100% adrenaline. Once you're 100% adrenaline, use a damage boosting ultimate ability and by then, Solak will be damageable. This part's really simple. 
go through the best DPS rotation you know. If your ultimate ability ends before the kill is over, either use the Zaros God Sword special if you're meleeing, use thresholds, or you could even use your adrenaline potion and get up to onslaught. That's what I elect to do here, as I don't have a Zaros God Sword in this setup, and dealing 75,000 damage with just thresholds does not seem like a good call. I will also mention if you're meleeing here and you don't have a grimoire, we did this intentionally with me camping a vampirism scrimshaw, but it would not be a bad idea to bring either a Ceridomen or preferably an Armital God Book just for this last phase. There will be several Blight Bombs as well as a large bomb from Solak during this phase, but these can be largely ignored as your soul split will keep your life points high. If you have Disruption Shield, it's not a bad idea to use it before you Onslaught, but we found the chance of you getting KO'd here is pretty low. The more damage you can output here, the easier it's going to be on your base in the realm. The amount of time they can buy you is extremely limited, so choose every ability carefully. If you're looking for sources on where to find good DPS rotations, I've linked some in the description down below. As the DPSer, if you can deal enough damage here, congratulations, you have successfully completed a Solak kill. But what do you have to do as the base? Welcome to Realm Tanking. In the realm, manifestations of Erethor will spawn and begin to damage Solak in the mind. These manifestations should not be killed, but need to be attacked so they switch their focus onto you. It's a tank test. You will have to use defensive abilities to stay alive for as long as you can. They attack with magic and can deal upwards of 3000 damage. Solak can be healed in the mind if the mind HP gets low, but only while the player is under the effects of barricade. This is done by clicking on Solak. In small teams of 2-3 players, the base should quickly deal some damage to Solak and then enter the realm to control the manifestations. The DPS rotation isn't completely set in stone, but the suggested base rotations can be followed pretty much exactly. As soon as the red message disappears, use Natural Instinct and then build to 100% Adrenaline. Make sure the boss is vulned and use Metamorphosis as soon as you can. You're gonna drink your Adrenaline Potion, Double Bleed, Dragon Breath, Wild Magic, Asphyxiate, and then Shatter before using the Extra Action button to go into the realm. If you don't have enough Adrenaline to Shatter, you can either use the Limitless ability or just throw in one more basic. If you brought a wand with the Chroming Perk on it, this is where you would put it on. Once inside the realm, pray Deflect Magic. Focus on tagging the manifestations as soon as they spawn. Chain is extremely good for this, but be warned, if you use Chain the second you enter the realm, it will not work and it will only hit one target. Wait one game tick first and you should be good to go. Use Reflect and Resonance and then Devotion as soon as your life points get low. After Devotion expires, immediately use Barricade. Do not kill any manifestations if you can help it, as when killed they will spawn in the real world and damage all the DPSers. While barricaded, you want to focus on tagging the new manifestations more than healing Solak. This is because you can't heal Solak particularly quickly, and even one or two stray manifestations attacking Solak will more than outweigh the healing you'd be able to provide. If you can do this rotation properly, and your DPSers do their job, the boss should die before you do. It's up to the DPSers to make it happen. If you're basing with ranged, you won't be able to get quite as much damage on Solak before heading into the realm, as there's no ranged equivalent to Metamorphosis unless you want to include the Eldritch Crossbow special attack, which is a little over budget. You're going to use Corruption, Needle Strike, Snipe, Snapshot, Rapid Fire, and then Shatter before using the Extra Action button. Once you're in the realm, it's exactly the same as with Magic. This rotation will buy you the most time in the realm and is ideal for larger teams, as the base does not need to be responsible for dealing much damage to Solak. You don't need to worry about using Natural Instinct as soon as the red message disappears, and instead use Natural Instinct as soon as Solak becomes damageable. While you're waiting in the cutscene, make sure the boss is vulned and assign one of the DPSers to Shatter, because you are not going to be using a damage boosting ultimate. This clip is from a 4-man scaled trio. That means we started with 4 people but somebody died, and because of this, I'm going into the realm and using this rotation with only 2 DPSers when there would normally be 3. Throw a couple basic abilities on Solak before pressing the extra action button and entering the realm. Once inside the realm, pray deflect magic and focus on tagging the manifestations as soon as they spawn. Use immortality and then build up to reflect. After that, you want to build back up to 100% adrenaline and use barricade as soon as your immortality goes off. After your barricade ends, use devotion. This should be an extremely long realm as you're likely to get over 20 seconds out of the immortality. With a barricade time of 12 seconds, as well as a devotion, you should be giving your DPSers plenty of time to get you out of there. Once again, do not kill the manifestations if you can help it. When killed, they will spawn in the real world and damage all of the DPSers. While barricaded, it's the same priorities as before. Focus on tagging the new manifestations more than healing Solak. You'll see that I made it out of the kill before I even had to use devotion, which would have bought me another 10 seconds of safety. 
And that's with two DPSers instead of three in a four-man scaled kill. So if nobody dies and you've got a full team, your DPSers should be able to get this done even if the rotations aren't perfect. Here are some items that you can use if you want to stay alive for an excessively long time in the realm. None of these things should be necessary at all, but I thought I would mention them just in case you're in a very specific situation where you want to do the longest realm of all time. A spirit shield will reduce your damage taken by 30%. The Maliotops player on farm perk will also extend the length of barricade by an additional 3.6 seconds. If you have a tier 90 shield, turtling 3, and the Maliotops perk, that means your barricade will last just over 17 seconds. A 3-piece acto switch could also be used to reset all your defensive cooldowns once in the realm. So you could use all of your important defensives, throw on the acto, and you'd likely be able to use them all a second time. Once again, none of these things are needed, but I am going to mention them just in case. The final rotation for phase 4 I'm going to talk about is No Realming. No Realming requires high-end melee gear and good rotations. The base must also have a melee switch to do this. When No Realming, nobody goes into the realm at all. You need to be able to finish off Solak in roughly 18 seconds. Anything over that and Solak's mind will die and then so will you. An example of a No Realm Berserk rotation is as follows and everyone in the team would go through effectively the same rotation. One person on the team would use Shatter, and you'd be guzzling your summoning flasks so that your familiar can spec more often as well. No Realms are the meta for high-end Solak teams, but I would strongly not recommend learning them when you're first getting into the boss. If even one person sausages the rotation, everyone on the team's going down. I think we just did it. That is everything you need to know about Solak. I hope. If it isn't, I'm sorry. I tried my very best. <laughs> Before we end this guide though, I am going to take you guys through one complete kill as the base perspective, where I'll add in any other little things that didn't make it into the mechanic by mechanic breakdowns. This way you'll also get to see times when I used ultimate abilities, and we'll also get to take a look at what the DPSer is doing at the same time. We're watching this in 2x speed. We both drop our Dominion Mines, and you want to drop them both at the same time. If they don't fall on the same tick, sometimes they won't go off. I'm going to start the boss encounter, and we're both going to be going through our DPS boosting ultimates. For me, that's a sunshine. We've got pads coming up right here, and we'd already established that I was going to take the closer one. I'm about to mess up my resonance timing, and I take a cool 3500 damage because of it. It's not the end of the world, though. After my sunshine, I'm going to head to the north and start working on my roots. This is also a good time to use devotion as you can extend it by killing targets. So if you kill both roots with it active, you'll actually get a 20 second devo. After that, I drop my dominion mines on the final root on my side, but you'll see there that my corruption actually touched the root. Because the root got damaged, my mines will not go off. I'm going to deal with my personal root and then sunshine in the middle of the room. I quickly noticed that I still had a root alive and I decided that it was not worth getting a lasher and wasting food. So I go and kill it. You'll notice that I'm not using defensives like Barricade or Debilitate or Reflect here. You'll see me use Devotion, and you'll also see me occasionally throw on my shield and put on Soul Split for a nice resonance. That should be enough to upkeep your life points for the most part. And you'll see I made it through Arms and Legs while going through less than one food. Into the Arms and Legs, I'm going to Vuln Mine, and I'm going to make sure my Titan is called and attacking as well. Outside of that, I'm just using Thresholds, and I'm building up to full Adrenaline. Before I Sunshine on the Legs, I actually use Detonate, as it will hit both, and it can be really, really nice. After that, I Sunshine, I Adren Pot, and I help my duo partner finish off his leg. After that, I use Vulnerability on the Blight Core, and I'm just using as many Thresholds as I can. You'll also see me use the Gothic Staff Special. That is not to debuff it in any way, that's just for the damage. At the end of the Blight Core, we're less than 100,000 damage away from hitting the HP cap, so we rush to get that done to avoid having to deal with any other Phase 1 mechanics. Because of this, we go right back into Arms and Legs once again, and this time around, because the core is well under half life points, we're going to be able to finish it off and get into Phase 2. There's a lot of soul splitting going on here, as Solak does not attack for really any of this. If you hit the HP cap, it's also not a bad idea to throw a Storm Shard on Solak as you're going to need them for last phase. Overall, despite messing up my Dominion Mines and that first resonance on the pads, I still managed to make it through the first phase while only using one food. Heading into phase 2, you can expect to go through easily half of your food, and if you have to, it's not that difficult to no food phases 3 and 4, so really, your food is for phase 2. The storm can hit pretty hard, and the mechanics do as well. This sample kill was recorded before an update that reduced the amount of life points the storm has, so you're going to see that we don't quite completely kill the storm here, but if you did exactly what we did now, the storm would be long gone. We didn't go up on the 3rd or 4th eruptions because we knew the storm was extremely low HP, and every time it hits you, its life points go down ever so slightly. The point of showing an entire kill is partially just to give you guys an idea of the pace of the fight, how quickly the mechanics go off. 
I didn't want to give you guys a list of exactly how many auto attacks are between each mechanic because counting and memorizing the auto attacks sounds super difficult and is super unnecessary as well. In general, whenever a mechanic starts, you have enough time to react to it. So you don't need to know exactly when it's coming. You just need to know that it's coming next and have an idea how to deal with it whenever that moment does come. I'm also going to add that it's generally the base's job to keep the boss vulned and I did a really bad job of that this kill. About 30% of the kill the boss wasn't vulned which means for 30% of the kill we were doing 10% less damage than we could have been. There's not a whole lot else to add about phase 2 here. I was fairly conservative and I made it out of the phase while only using one and a half Sardomen Bruise. If I'd wanted to, I could have turned some of that food into more damage output by using fewer defensive abilities, but overall, you'll see I didn't spend much time with my shield on outside of the occasional resonance, and I was going through my DPS rotations correctly. I think a lot of people blow all their food on phase 2 by eating up to full right before points where they've either got a chance to get a resonance to full HP or they can just soul split all the way back up. By knowing the mechanics and having an idea of what's coming next, you should be able to save yourself almost all of the food that you'd otherwise go through. We're going to start phase 3 by cleansing at Marathil, although a lot of teams actually stay north the entire time just to save time. But we're learning here, and taking 55% extra damage does not sound like a good time to me. You're going to see I've charged up the first pad, and every time you charge a pad, you'll see a blight hit come down from the sky. It's a very low hit of roughly 2000 damage, but if you want to avoid it, you can step out of the pad once it's charged up. In general, it's not super necessary to do this because you're going to get a chance to soul split back up afterwards anyway, but if you're not lazy, it could save you a food or two over the course of the whole phase. After the second pad is charged, I actually enter the mine realm and use Metamorphosis. This clip was recorded before an update that reduced the amount of life points that Aerithor has. Now, as the base, you would just stay out and soul split on every single pad. As the base, you want to make sure you don't charge up all 8 pads as that will instantly start phase 4. But charging up as many as 7 pads is a good idea. It gives you more opportunities to soul split, which is just going to save you and the DPSer a bunch of food. You're going to see here that the fourth pad didn't charge for a while, and this is because it's based on Solak's position, and sometimes if he's angled in a weird way, the pad will not detect that he's close enough. If that happens, just move back and forth a bit and you should be good to go. By the way, one thing I brushed over earlier on in the guide is aura choice. Auras don't make a massive difference at this boss, and you can certainly do it and learn it with no aura, but if you are going to choose an aura, the Majorat aura is fantastic, especially for learning, as you get a damage bonus, but you also don't take increased damage either. Alternatively, the Berserker or Maniacal variant auras are good too, and Dark Magic would also be a decent option. You're going to see here that we're very close to the phase cap of 300,000 life points. Because of this, I've only partially charged up the fifth pad, and I'm actually going to run away and do a little more damage to Solak before I bring Solak back onto it for it to finish charging. Once it's completely charged, we are heading in to the last phase. When you're finishing off Aerithor, there's no reason for the base not to go into the realm, as there's nothing to do outside. Because phase 3 kind of goes at its own pace, it's the ideal phase to stack storm shards. Ideally, by the time you head into phase 4, you've got 8 shards on the boss, and then you can throw the last 2 on in your natural instinct as you're building up to your ultimate ability on phase 4. Speaking of phase 4, we made it. Let's slow it back down to real time. I'm going to make sure the boss is vulned, I'm going to use my natural instinct, and then I'm using metamorphosis. I'm going to go through the exact rotation that was listed earlier, with my basic abilities and my 3 thresholds most importantly. You are also going to notice that I ate up a little bit here before going into the realm, and even once I got into the realm, I was not full HP. This was a mistake, and during that cutscene, I should have eaten up to full. I miscalculated how many life points my soul split would give me, and that almost cost me right at the end here. I've used my reflect, and now that my life points are a little under half, I'm going to use devotion. I'm going to continue tagging manifestations, and this is where I made a slight mistake. I should have barricaded when my devotion had one second left on it, but I got distracted looking at all the new manifestations spawning in. Because of this, I took a big hit and almost died. Still, I managed to get my barricade off on time, and the kill was over shortly after. Okay, that is a full Solak kill. With that, I just want to say thank you very much for watching this video. I appreciate the support, and I really hope it helped. If you learned anything about Solak while watching this, feel free to hit that like button, or don't. I don't really mind. One final thing I'm going to mention is the archaeology skill is coming out shortly after this guide is released. I am aware that some of the metas may change, but the way that the Solak mechanics are dealt with should not, and for that reason, this guide should still be relevant past the release of archaeology. That being said, the archaeology relics will be a DPS increase, so if nothing else, they should make this boss fight even easier. With all that said, I hope you're all well, thank you very much for watching, have a good one, and peace out. That is it for me. It's 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to bed.